all for coming. I know we have some other folks that will be joining us, so there may be some folks uh, popping in intermittently. So um, hopefully they'll just make themselves at home. Um, I'm really excited today to have Sandra Stowe here with us. Um, we had the opportunity to meet, um, I think, either during or prior COVID via Facebook initially. Yeah, it was. Um, yep. And talked a little bit back and forth about um, the history of the Stowe family and, and uh, the importance and the impact that she's had on our region and on the, on the community. And so I'm really just so pleased to have you here to do our conversation on culture this, this month. Um, I'm not going to try to read uh, Sandra's bio because it is impressive and long and I will not do nah. justice. Nah. Um, but um, I know that Sandra has got a lot to share with us today about um, the Still family. And just for those of you who are either new to the area or new to the center, um, Curtin Center for the Arts is an arts education institution. Uh, we primarily focus on visual and performing arts, uh, but that is foundation of what we do and everything else stems forth from that. Um, so as part of our um, part of our connection to the community and part of our uh, Folk Life Center efforts, um, we do this series of conversations on culture where we bring in notable um, either historians or artists or individuals in the community um, to broaden that base of arts to be not just the arts but also the arts and the humanities. Um, so again we're really pleased to have you here. Thank you for thank you for inviting me. Really. Um, now this is probably my first presentation since COVID hit. A couple years ago, I was doing a presentation a month. I think in 2018, 2019, I think I did a presentation every month from here to Pittsburgh to Cape Cod, and so on. And sometimes there's three people, sometimes there's 150 people. Um, so. And I use a PowerPoint because sometimes I go down bunny trails, start telling little stories about the family. So I have to use a PowerPoint to keep on track. All right, I, I did this presentation last year during COVID. The Croc Center asked me to come and speak for 20 minutes. I had no PowerPoint. They had a video camera. They sat me down in front of this video camera and I just started talking. An hour later, <laughs> I forgot that I was supposed to talk for 20 minutes. So an hour later, I said, they said, wow, that was a long 20 minutes. I was like, well, how come no one ever stopped me? <laughs> They're like, because we all just got into the story and we couldn't stop you. So it turned into a three-part video series that we have on YouTube now. So all that to say, my name is Samuel Calvin Still III. I'm the second great-grand nephew of Dr. James Still, William Still, and their brother named Peter Still. Their older brother, who was the first freeborn of the family after the, the, my grandparents, I say grandparents, but it's like my third great-grandparents, became came to Jersey. They had a son named Samuel who was born in 18, uh, February 22nd, I think, February, February 22nd, uh, 1806, 1807. And I'll show it up here because I have, I have all the dates up here. Um, his name was Samuel, and I was the first... He was the, uh -oh. there we go, technical difficulties. Did this thing blank out? Yeah, but, there we go. Okay. So, their older brother Samuel was the first freeborn of the family. And it was said to have, that she had, eight, my grandmother had 18 children, but we only know of 14 to survive to uh, adulthood. This right here is uh, their headstone. That's located out in Shimon, out off of Stokes Road. My grandfather's name was, uh, third great grandfather was Levin. His wife's name was Charity. I'll get into that. Angelina was Dr. Still's first wife, and this Beulah was his daughter. As you see, his wife died at when she gave birth to Beulah, and Beulah died a year later. All right. And this is William Still. This is an actual picture of William Still. It's a picture of Dr. James Still, who became the Black Doctor of the Pines, and Peter Still, who was left in slavery for 40 years and reunited with the family. Are they actually brothers? 
all three of these men are brothers. And again, this is an artist's rendition. This is, almost, this is more of an artist's rendition, but this is an actual picture of William Still. And I always say to people that this, these hands run in my family. I can, t I can see it. In, I saw it in my father's hands. The, the facial structure also ran in my father's. Um, so it's, it's very interesting uh, history. Welcome. Come on in. Come on in. Just grab a chair. I got to put some chairs back there because um, this is real close. You might feel like I'm, you know, right on top of you or something. <laughs> So, again, my presentation is on the legacy of American family, still family history. I start my presentation talking a little bit about important facts about slavery. It happened. It was a horrible thing that happened, but it happened. And we need to be able to talk about it so that we never repeat it. But we need to understand also why it, in this country it stayed so long. We know in the 17th and 18th century, tea, coffee, and tobacco become social patterns in England. It just wasn't for the wealthy, but it became mass consumption. English consumption of sugar in 150 years increased by 2,500% by the early 19th century. Sugar was processed from sugarcane and was a very labor-intensive crop. We know in 1516, sugarcane was harvested and sent back to Spain from the West Indies. Thus, the slave trade began from the west coast of Africa, and we know in 1619, 401 years ago, right, 402 years ago, um, a, Dutch, a Dutch ship transported 20 Africans to Jamestown, Virginia. Interesting, in New Jersey, in 1664, it was called the Concessions and Agreement of 1664, which offered 60 acres of land for every enslaved African imported to New Jersey, which helped to increase the slave population. They needed the, the population for, for labor. So you've got, you know, slave trade. This is the main sources. I think my family primarily came from, I know on my, probably on my mother's side, the mix is out of my, this area of Nigeria. Um, and they transported enslaved Africans all over, all down through Brazil, Argentina, all through these areas. That's why you see in Cuba and the Dominican Republic, you've got light skin and dark skin, because they're all, it's a mixture of, the, of a lot of different cultures there. And then Charleston. We know in 1677, the first Quaker proprietors arrived in Burlington and Gloucester counties. 1683, John Hug purchased from the proprietors 1,300 acres of land in Gloucester County. Within the bounds of John Hug's plantation, a small community of enslaved Africans known as Guinea Town, located in, which is located today in the present owner of Brooklawn, Belmar, and Mount Ephraim, New Jersey. And that's a good point. I'm going to go back to that, that plantation, to that, that name, and what they did on that plantation. We know in 1761, slave ship Hannah transported cargo of slaves from the coast of Guinea and auctioned in Delaware River. As you know, that Camden, the Cooper Ferry, was where they sold slaves right there on the, on the, on the docks of Camden at the end of Cooper River. They now have a sign there saying this was a slave uh, auction at the time. Uh, marking that there was a slave auction. We know in 1797, Guinea Town was a, a small community of freed slaves, which was located within the area of the Hug Plantation. What's an interesting point uh, in Brona County and Gloucester County was that in 1800, 80% of Brona County and 90% of Gloucester County, the New Jersey, uh, the black population was free. And that was because of the Quakers who set the <coughs> who ended slavery as a part of their, their religion or their culture in 1787, which allowed, which they freed a lot of the black, blacks that they had. They didn't allow them to become Quakers, but they did free them. And they did also help them, um, sometimes giving them parcels of land and, and such. Um, New Jersey was the last state 
of the Northeast to, to abolish slavery. And what, it, what, what we did, we know in, in 1804, New Jersey passed this act of gradual abolition of slavery, which meant that if you were born of a slave, enslaved African, your mother was enslaved, it took, it was you, when you got to the age of 25 years of age for a male and 21 years age of a woman, you were allowed to be free. And that was the break even point commercially, economically, because they figured they had to feed you and clothe you. Now, how much they fed a slave and clothed a slave couldn't have been that much. But what was also interesting was that when people got, when enslaved Africans got close to that age, those plantation owners a lot of times sold those slaves further south into Louisiana to keep them in bondage. So what we need to understand is that slavery stayed around this country for the years that it did because of economics. It was free labor, right? 1861, the Civil War began. Confederates attacked Fort Sumner, South Carolina. We know in 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation issued by President Lincoln only freed the slaves in the state's rebellion against the Union. He didn't free all the slaves. He only freed the slaves that was in the, the, the states that were part of Confederate. And that was because they needed the manpower. They needed the soldiers for the Civil War. One third of the Union Army was African. The Civil War, and in 1865, the Civil War ends, the 13th Amendment, Abolish slavery throughout the nation. South Jersey still family early beginnings. Those Guinea Town residents would later move into an area called Snow, Snow Hill, which we know now is called Lawnside. Some of the earliest West Jersey documented enslaved still family members date back as far as 1752. In the manumissions, the manumissions were uh, were documents that, that were used to, um, to document slaves, slaves who got their freedom, all right? So, and they were found in, 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 in a lot of times in land deed books. They weren't separated books until later on, much until like 1810, when they started down south. They would, they would log those um, freedoms in separate books. So there were a lot of times they were, they were in deed books. And we know that there was a Philip Hope and Candace Still that were manumitted March 2nd, 1787. Their owner was an Esther Wilkins in Esham Township. Esham Township at that time encompassed Medford, Mount Laurel, Voorhees, Marth, it was a very large township. We know in the Gloucester County at the abolitionist census in 1798, listed as free men of color, there was a Tab Still, a Cubit Still, a James Still, not the same Dr. James, a John Still, a Bonham Still, also. We know, I've got um, historian has, has given me this information that, that he's located 90 antebellum black communities that existed in South Jersey. There are communities that were small black enclaves of free people, the blacks, all throughout South, South Jersey. Places like Freehaven, Sadler Town, Snow Hill, Coleman Town, Burlington, Petersburg, Little Texas, Clarksboro, Indian Mills. Little Texas, if you ever go out Morristown, Mount Laurel Road, and when you get to go underneath the underpasses where the, the turnpike's at, there's a street called Texas Avenue. That Texas Avenue was Little, Little Texas. It's a black community there. Sat Snow Hill is Lawnside. Sadler Town is in Haddonfield. Coleman Town is Mount Laurel, Coleman Town Cemetery. So these are all places that you probably go by every day and they didn't even know. Which I just found fascinating because I didn't I didn't know until I to start looking into it. Free Haven? Free Haven is uh, like Lawnside area. Right. right. Yeah, they're around the same areas, yep. Yeah. And Snow Hill, Snow Hill was called Snow Hill not because of the name of the, the city of Maryland. It was named after because when they cut all the, when they cut all the trees down the top of it, because it almost was a, it's an outlying outcrop of the pine barrens. So when it cut all the trees down the top of this hill, from a distance, it looked like a snow, looked like a snow hill. 
So my point is that there were several still families that, that thrived in these black communities. Did I skip something? Okay, no. So here's, I did, a little, did some work and did some, uh, didn't, didn't do the whole uh, line, but there's a Cupid Still family out of Esham, the Edwards Still family out of Snow Hill, AKA Lawnside, New Jersey. And this is an important fact. Also, there was a King Still in Esham. And every, they all had a bunch of kids. <laughs> Probably in between harvest or something, right? <laughs> so long comes my grandparents, Levin and Charity, still, Steele. 1798, Levin Steele, my third great grandfather, purchased, purchased his freedom from his young slave owner, a gentleman named William Wood. Um, and his wife, Sydney, at the time, that's what her name was, escaped, had to escape twice from. Um, her slave owner, who was that was nicknamed Saunders, but we found out later on that his real name was Alexander Griffin. And they were in Caroline County, Maryland at the time. Levin and Sidney Steele, Steele arrived in Shemung. Sidney changed, changed her name to Charity, and they modified their last name to Steele in order to hide within the other free Still families. So essentially, my family was grafted into the Still families that lived and thrived all through the area. So we consider ourselves cousins, but we're not blood related. It's just like if you had a family friend that you just grew up with all your life, you know, cousin Joe, you know, <laughs> hey family, right? And it's an important fact when you're trying to do your genealogy, you need to know that fact. But it surprises people because everybody thinks all the still families are connected. So when you meet Joe Still down the street, he's going to tell you his uncle is. William Still, it may not be. And for that, I've gotten in trouble. So, Charity has claimed that Charity had 18 children, but only 14 were documented. And I don't know about you, but I had two. Uh, <laughs> my father had 18. They lived down in Shimon. They lived in the old original homestead. And one, of, now again, I say I don't tell jokes, but here's a joke. Here's a little story. They said one day the sheriff came to my grandfather's house and told my grandfather, I heard you have some stills out here. And my grandfather said, yeah, I got a few. <laughs> so we started calling up my aunts and uncles and my dad's out the house. And the sheriff left my father alone, left my grandfather alone after that. So they traveled from Caroline County, more likely into Dover. They crossed over here somewhere along the Rehoboth Beach area and crossed into um, Greenwich or Greenwich. I, I call it wrong, I named it wrong, I got corrected a few weeks ago. It's Greenwich. And in that little area of Greenwich, there was a small black enclave called Springtown Othello. Uh, one of the oldest Amy churches is located there in that town. And it's called the historic Bethel Amy Church. Um, and understand that the Amy churches were set up by Richard Allen, who was an Amy minister. And those Amy churches were underground railroad stops, most of them. So on into Swedesboro, where was another Amy church. More likely into Mount Laura, which is in Mount Holly, which is still all part of Esham. That's where they, they ran into these other still families. And those other still families allowed them to, to take on the last name. And what makes that important is that if, if it wasn't for those families, my family's last name could have been Robinson. Could have been Johnson, could have been anything. The story could have totally, completely have changed. She could have got caught and sent back to slavery, and the story, would, the story that we have today, would be completely changed. Totally, the whole story could have just not been there, right? She would have been recaptured. She wouldn't have had 14 children. It would have been in bondage and so on and so on. And when she left, the first time she left, she had four children. She had two daughters and two sons. The children's name was Mahala Katara. Peter and Levin Jr. She got caught the first time that she came across over in the Greenwich and sent back to slavery down, down to the, the plantation, Alexander Griffith's plantation. And so he locked her up in the, the, the garret of the house, thinking that if he kept her there, she would somehow or another not want to become free. Like he would 
beat, he would beat that out of her. I don't know. Well, it didn't beat it out of her. But unfortunately, on the second trip, she had to make this tremendous hard decision to leave two of her children. And she left Peter and she left Levin Jr. in slavery, thinking that they would have a better chance of surviving slavery than the girls did. So she escaped at night. She went off with her sister. She had a sister with her, Nancy. She left her mother. And she reconnected with my grandfather, probably back over in Greenwich, and on into Mahali area. She assumed the last name still. And then she changed her name from Sydney to Charity. And then, to be even more secretive, you move in the middle of Pine Barrens. Now, I don't know the last time you've been to Pine Barrens, but I was there about a week or two ago. And it's, I can't imagine what it must have looked like in the 1800s back then. They moved in an area that was, that was an old uh, Native American res reservation called the Brotherton Reservation. Uh, it was pretty much going away. They brought some property from a free black man named Cato. And the property was called the Cato Bounds. Here's Levin Steele's manumission papers that I researched and found a few years ago. Uh, November 22nd, 1798. I, William Wood of Caroline County in the state of Maryland, do hereby set free from bondage my Negro man called Levin Steele, aged about 24 years, and do for myself my heirs, executors, administrators, release unto the said Levin Steele all my right and all claim whatsoever as to person or to any estate whatsoever may acquire, hereby declaring the said Negro man called Levin Steele absolutely free without any interruption from me or any other person claiming under me in witness whereof I have here, here, hereunto set my hand and seal this 22nd day, 11th month, 17, 1798. William Wood. That's a copy of the actual manumission paper. I had it transcribed. I found that in the, county, the, the Caroline County, Maryland archives. And I can't even tell you how I felt. It was weird. It was just. And I, and I traced them through. William Wood became an orphan. And a lot of times what happened, slaves were, because they were property, when somebody died, the slave owner died, they willed them to the children. So a lot of times the families got split apart and so on and so on. So William Wood got Levin from his grandmother, Margaret Banning. And I traced all this through either, either through wills, and then I traced it because William Wood became an orphan. Because he was an orphan, he had to document how he made his money because he owned property. And Levin would go out and work for him. So each year it was like Levin, a boy named Levin, made $1,000 from so-and-so. So I traced them that way, and then finally, I got his actual manumission paper. They were, they were, supposedly, they were both around the same age. Fortunately, William Wood wasn't too fond of slavery, as you can tell, because he didn't even, there's no, there's no note about how much he even charged Levin. He didn't even charge him. This here is a list of the 14 children, this list was this was this list was made because I said that she left two sons in slavery, right? Well, when Peter still finally be, became free, they gave him this list so he knew who his his brothers and sisters were. So here's there was an Anne, I believe Anne must have died before she even tried to escape, because there's no mention of her anywhere. But there's Levin, Levin Jr., Peter Still, the one who, who these two were left in slavery, and Mahala and, and Kitty or Katara, they were brought, um, they made the treacherous truck with their mother to freedom. And here's my second great grandfather, Samuel Still. All right, February 26, 1807. Um, and then there was a Mary Still, a Hannah Still, Dr. James, April 9th, 1812. Isaac still, uh, there's a John, Charles, 
Joseph, and the baby of the bunch is William Still, who became the father of the Underground Railroad. This was a document that was written for Peter Still when he became free. And I found it in, it's called the Peter Still Documents at Rutgers Digital Library. They gave this to him so he would know who his family was. It's, a song, it's all online. It's online. Okay. It's online. You can actually look it up. There's a series, in that, in, that, in that collection of documents, there's a series of letters from Peter Still to William Still to the woman that wrote the book about Peter Still. Um. <coughs> so I put it so you can kind of read it a little better. And I confirmed all this with some census reports and other, other reports that I had. We know that the patriarch Levin died on December, December 24, 1842. In Levin's will, he bequeathed all, all the estate after paying all the debts off to his wife, Charity. A Samuel, my second great grandfather, was given the farm known as Cato Bounds. I like that name, Cato Bounds. It sounds like a movie or, or, or a book, you know? Samuel Still and Cato Bounds. <laughs> uh, Dr. Still was given a seven acre partial of land. Uh, the remaining personal property that was divided amongst the remaining children, Mahala, Katara, uh, Mary, Charles, John, and, and uh, William Still. In 1843, though, there were, there were only nine free and one still enslaved, and that was Peter. Note that, uh, note that Peter Still in 1843 was still enslaved in Alabama, unbeknownst to his family, and that Levin Jr. had passed away while enslaved in December 28, 1831. What happened with them was that when she left them, a lot of times the fear was that if your family, if there was family members left in the plantation, those family members that would get the chance to get free would come back, would find a way to come back to get their family members. So a lot of times these slave owners would immediately sell the rest of the family off if they could. So Peter and Levin were sold off to Kentucky. They ended up living a very hard life through Kentucky and Alabama. And finally, Peter was left and, and uh, was, was able to buy his freedom in 1850. And I'll talk briefly about that. And that story is just amazing. But I just want to bring that so you understand I leave anything out there. Because you're probably going, who's oh, Peter? Where'd he go? How did he connect it? We'll get to all that. Um, so just kind of bear with me. <clears throat> Oh, there's something missing. My apologies. There's supposed to be a document here, and it's the affidavit from Edward Mahala Still, which is from Snow Hill. And this is a document that's an affidavit from Dr. James Still. What happened between these two documents, uh, Mahala and Edward had a son named Charles Still. Dr. James Still was so well known that a lot of people used him. But this Charles still was looking for to try to get his, his Civil War pension when he came out of Civil War because he got hurt in Civil War. So he went to apply for the pension, but when he applied for it, Dr. James and, his, and this guy's parents had to, had to write an affidavit saying that there were no blood relation. There's no blood relation between the two. That's a very significant point because here it is documented. And this document was probably just found maybe like, I don't know, maybe five to, five to eight years ago. And my apologies, because I have both documents. And it, it's, it's, this is in the Civil War um, um, pension papers. And I've discovered in my, in my research that the two progenies married into one another. In 1909, the marriage of Hubert M. Still III and Juanita, or Juanetta Still, Juanita Still was the granddaughter of Dr. James Still, and Cubitt Still was a grandson of Cubitt M. Still from Nishan. They, these families knew they weren't even blood related. They were one, two generations. In 1875, we have a William Still and a Henrietta Still. William Still traces back to, to possibly a Bowman Still out of Esham, New Jersey. And Henrietta Still was the granddaughter of Levin Still, the daughter of Samuel Still. So she was really like an aunt to me. Um, and as much as I, as we, as I talk to other historians, 
we realized that they, they weren't like in maroon communities. And this inter, intermarriage happened in like maroon communities, like in the Great Dismal Swamp. Uh, what's the other swamp down in Florida? The Okanofi or whatever, where, where fugitive slaves hid. And because they were hiding, they had to end up marrying, intermarrying each other. Or like, you know, so you had a lot of that, but you didn't really need that in New Jersey. These communities weren't secluded and they weren't hiding. Not even Timbuktu was that way. So, you know, these, these stills knew they weren't related to each other, so it was okay to get married. There are only one, two generations from, from being enslaved. So, I'm moving to William Still. Now, William Still was proclaimed at his death in 1902, the father of the Underground Railroad. He wrote a book called The Underground Railroad, authored the book in 1872. He was a civil rights off, uh, activist, a social, successful entrepreneur, sold land, ice, coal, and stoves, quite a philanthropist in the city of Philadelphia. This picture here is of his coal yard in his coal yard over on South Washington Street in uh, Philadelphia. And I think the address is, yeah, 1212, 1216, 1220 South Washington Street. So he didn't have just like one little block. He had a whole block. Yeah. 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 He was the first African American to ever sit on the Philadelphia Board of Trade when after, after slavery had ended. Um, his story is that he began working in the Pennsylvania Anti Slavery Office in 1847, started working as a janitor and a mailroom clerk. He married a woman named Letitia. They rented a home at 17 Ronaldson Street, which today is still standing, and it's, it's called, it's at 1620, 625 South Delhi Street. And they rented this property from 1850 to 1855. What makes it a significant point is that that was the height of when William Still was helping fugitives come through slavery. So people like Harriet Tubman, John Brown, all those people, Frederick Douglass, were all visiting him at his home. Their home was considered a way house as part of the Underground Railroad Network. He often hid runaways and, and held meetings with key abolitions at their home. 1852, he, it was reorganized as the Vigilance Committee in the Anti-Slavery Office and was appointed the chairman of the, of the uh, Vigilance Committee. He provided not only the network of hideouts, but also the money, train, ticket, train tickets, food, medicine, lodging, clothing for escaping enslaved Africans. He's accounted for over 800 fugitives who arrived in assistance within his 14 years of service. So he worked with John Brown. He knew of John Brown's uh, raid on Harper's Ferry a year, at least a year in advance. And, and William wasn't for it, actually. He, 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 for, he told John, like, this is not, not going to work. And of course, John, and if you ever read him, John Brown, John Brown was a straight radical. God bless him, but he was adamant um, that slavery needed to end and that Harper's Ferry would be the match, was the match that stroke the fire, that lit the fire for the Civil War. So much so that I actually met family members of John Brown's a couple years ago. And we got talking. We was at a, a Black History event. And the woman and I and her husband were talking a lot in the hotel lobby. And we got talking. And, I, and she said, I just found all this information out that I was his great, great, whatever granddaughter. And I was like, well, your family didn't keep records of it? She's like, no. When, when John Brown's wife came, after he was executed, she immediately took the family to California. They changed their name and forbade them to ever talk about their father being as John Brown. Because it because the country looked at John Brown as being a, a you know an insurrectionist. He was a you know he was not a patriot, right? So they didn't want that they didn't want that stigma lab, labeled on him. And it was so much that she said that when she ran into uh, when she started doing some research on this, when she, she got word of it, she went to one of her family members who had a bunch of information on this, and the family member made her sign a document saying that she would never disclose where she got this information from. And I was like, really? It's 150 years later. She's like, trust me. She's like, it's amazing. 
you know. Um, so this is the house that's still standing at 625 South Delhi Street in, over in Philadelphia. Just, just a small row home. Like I said, he worked with Terrence, Thomas Garrett, Harriet Tubman, William Lloyd Garrison. If you've seen the movie Harriet, Leslie Odom portrayed my Uncle William in that movie. Um, Louis Tappan, the Tappan brothers up in New York, Samuel Burris, him and Thomas Garrett were very good friends, Lucretia Mott, and William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison was like mobbed, almost mobbed to death in Boston um, because he was so much against the ending of slavery. Um, you know, and still helped create the network that Harry Tubman used to free slaves. He was a vital operation to vital operation in the underground railroad in this area. Um, and a lot of it's funny because not funny, but it's interesting that growing up when you, I went to Morristown. I don't know about anybody else. I went through Morristown, and you know when they teach about Harry Tubman, it's like they made Harry Tubman act like. It made her appear like she was this person that went all down through, all through the South and freed all these people. And now we realize they've discovered that she really only freed the 70 people that were a family down in George, Dorchester, Maryland. And how she got the name the General is because she was a nurse and a scout on a Civil, on a civil War a Union. Uh, uh, she was attached to a Union Army uh, group that was down in South Carolina that helped free slaves off a lot of plantations off the river, off the rivers down through uh, South Carolina. So she was given his name the general. But the, they don't tell, tell us that in history. They made it sound like she was like on her own. You know, she was this single black woman that just like carried a shotgun and was like, I'm going to go free people. And she did this with all this help from other people. It was a network. And it was a loose network to the point that you could, you could live here you could be 10 miles away, and y'all could be going to church together, right? But you would never talk about the fact that your home was a safe house for enslaved Africans, unless you was on that network. Frances Ellen Harper, William still, he was so fond of her, she was a poet that he named his daughter after Frances Ellen. Beautiful poet, poetry. Um, and it was about slavery. Again, John Brown, Lewis Tappan, you know, he confided, John Brown confided his still about his plans for six months prior to the raid on Harper's Ferry. Um, and after, and after um, the raid ended, uh, William still aided John Brown's accomplices after the Harper's Ferry Rebellion. He asked his wife, uh, John Brown's wife stayed with William Still, and she gave William Still a locket of John Brown's hair. In those days, if you gave somebody, after they died, you gave somebody close to them a locket of their hair, it was a symbol to say they were very close to you. And the Underground Railroad was the only document written of its time. What... William Still was charged to do, when people came into his office, like if you saw the movie Harriet, he immediately was sat down and asked them, where'd you come from? Who was your master? Was he nice? Was it, you know, what was your circumstances? How'd you get away? You know, what, why'd you leave? Who'd you leave behind? And he wrote all this stuff down, and he had to hide it in the cemetery, in a crypt. Because when the 1850 law, Great Compromise, came about, those documents could have been used to go back and recapture people, right? Because 1850 was supposed to stop the expansion of slavery and allow the slave owners to uh, license agents to come up north and recapture people. So you didn't have your paperwork on you, you could get recalled. If you've seen 12 Years a Slave, that's what happened to 12 Years a Slave, right? Um, so it was very important and why it's so important, let's see if I have it on here. All right. Here's some of the noteworthy escapes, narratives. John, Jane Johnson, 
Henry Box Brown, William Allen Craft. Jane Johnson was on the docks, came up with her, her slave owner from Virginia. He was a former colonel, I guess, in the Army. And he was the ambassador to Nicaragua. Now, I didn't even know Nicaragua was even a country. But he's on his way to Nicaragua. He brought Jane Johnson, who was his, truly was his mistress. He left his wife at home. He took his slave woman, his African slave woman, with him. Right? She brought one of her children. But when they got up to Philadelphia, she got a note to William Still that she wanted to be free. She passed it on through a little boy. The little boy passed it on, and, and they got it to William Still in his office. William Still immediately goes down with his uh, a Quaker lawyer who was a gentleman named Passmore Williams. They go down. They go to her and say, if you leave with us today, you can be free. Because you came across with your slave owner. You, you, weren't, you weren't a fugitive. You came across with them. That's where the law was written. So they immediately took her away. And there was a big commotion on the So you imagine, this is broad daylight. You know, it's like me. And, and again, Colonel Wheeler, you know, again, that's his property. That's like someone walking up and saying, I'm taking my projector and he's walking away with it. I'm like, no, you're not taking my projector. It's mine. Well, that's how he thought about Jane Johnson. What, was in, what makes the story interesting is that they whisk her away. Uh, William still gets locked up. Pastor William gets locked up. They get out on bail, whatever, they cope, they, and they go back to court months later. And also what was interesting about the court system was that because John Wheeler was a friend of the President of the United States, the courts went straight from the Philadelphia courts to the federal courts. They just jumped the whole level of the judicial branch because he was, he was friends with the President. So it jumped the, whole, it jumped the whole thing. So they had this court, and it's the first time the African-American woman or person came back to the city of Philadelphia to the, to the courts and gave a testimony. And what was interesting was that the police officers who were friends of the abolitionists were on one side of the courtroom, and the U.S. Marshals was on the other side of the courtroom, and they were friends with Colonel Wheeler. So when this woman came into the courtroom, she gave her testimony, and when she got finished, the Philadelphia police officer had to grab her and surround her because the U.S. Marshals were trying to snatch her and take her. Just, I, I don't know if you can imagine, it's like people's court, right? You know, the commotion, you got law on one side. I, I just, you know, they need, that's another movie that needs to be made, you know? So she does get away. She, when she's at court, she testifies that, no, I wasn't kidnapped. I left to my own free will. Henry Box Brown, five foot five. He lived in Richmond, Virginia. He decided to leave because his wife and children were sold off and he didn't know, where to, he didn't know how to get hold of them. So he, he, so he, he friended a, 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 a gentleman in Richmond, it was a white, a white gentleman, and I think he was a shoe, a shoe, a shoe uh, shoemaker or something like that, but he owned a store. So he decided that he was going to ship himself in a box. That's the name Henry Box Brown. But the box was two foot eight by three foot by two foot. He's five foot five. Now, at the Dr. James Center, we have a replica of that box. And if I had it here, you would be like, there's no way in the world. And the box had on it this side up. He had a canteen of water, which really was like an animal skin. They made canteens out of animal skin back then, right? And he had hardtack, which is old, day old bread, biscuits. You know, they were hardtack. So they put him in this box. They ship it to the Philadelphia office. And it says this side up. And it was about 28 hours. But for most of those hours, he was upside down. But when he came out of the box, he sung the 40th song. Sung the 40th song. And they were worried that he was going to be dead when they got him. Well, the 40th song, is a, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a chapter in the Bible. It's a song. It's a song. Song, yeah. Song. song. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, but I've never heard the Psalms sung in, in voice. You know, except for one gentleman did it, and that was Barry, uh, Barry Moore would do it for, for us. So, and then William and Ellen Craft. How did they ship? ship? Well, they put him in a box. They shipped him by, I think out of Richmond, he was on a ship for a while down the James River, down to Norfolk or something like that. And he was on a train for a while, and then he was in a carriage for a while. So it was like a 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tossed around. And they had a couple holes in the box. You know? Just, and, and it changed the whole way the U.S. Postal Service checked their packages after that. Because the word got out when he got free. It was a big deal. It was on the newspapers that this enslaved African. Now everybody in the South was worried about these packages going north. You know, now we got to stuck. Now, you know, they're probably sticking the pitchforks in the cotton bales and make sure no one's hiding them. But it changed the whole way the U.S. Postal Service worked or operated. Now, William and Ellen Craft, her father was a slave owner. So she was very, very light skinned and fair skinned. This was her husband. They came out of Macon, Georgia. They decided, I think it was around Christmas time, that what she would do, she dressed up like a man. She, she pretended to have a, a toothache, so they, dropped, they wrapped her mouth up, and they put it, and it said she had a broken arm or something. So she had an arm in a sling and her mouth all wrapped up, and she couldn't talk. So the husband did all the talking for her. So they pretended that he was her slave, and she was the man traveling up north. And they went from Georgia all the way to into South Carolina, stayed in some of the best hotels, and every place they would go, he would speak for them. And when they got up here to Philadelphia, ran and went and got to William Still, they became free. They ended up going over to England. And after slavery, they came back. They went back to Georgia after slavery and ended, started school for colored children, and the Klan burned down the school, burned them up. Some of William Steele's accomplishments after the Civil War. Founder of the Christmas Street YMCA in 1889. He was a leader in ending the segregation of streetcars in 1867. He started a boycott, and the boycott took about eight years, and it crippled the whole uh, trolley car system. He was a member of the statewide colored independent party. Um, he gave an address of voting and laboring in 1874. 1902, in the obituary New York Times reported, he was known throughout the country, the father of the underground railroad. But why I noticed the address of voting and laboring in 1864 is this, 1874, was that at that time, um, William still became, again, by the time 1874, he's well known. He had published his book. He was a coal merchant, very well known, very proper. Um, didn't, do, didn't do a lot of the partying that people, social life stuff he did. Because he was so adamant about trying to do the right thing for Africans and African Americans in the city of Philadelphia. Because there's a lot of issues, a lot of segregation, a lot of, a lot of prejudice stuff going on. But at that time, his, the Republican Party, a lot of blacks automatically voted Republican because of Abraham Lincoln. William still didn't have a problem with the, Repu the National Pub Republican Party. He had a problem with the Republicans in the city of Philadelphia because they were corrupt. They were crooks, and he didn't like it. So he ended up giving his, um, what do they call it, saying that he was voting for somebody who was part of the independent party. And people went crazy over it. Like, how dare you? What's wrong with you, William? You're a prominent black in this city, and why aren't you not voting Republican? So they made him come and talk at a town hall meeting such as like this, in a bigger place. But he said basically in his address was that you need to take the time to learn about the people you vote for. Just don't vote along party lines. Learn about who you're voting for. Just don't vote because everybody else is doing it. And that was really the summary of what he said to them. But it caused a lot of problems with him. People wanted to boycott his businesses and all kinds of things. But he was adamant about you need to take the time to learn who you're voting for. Just don't vote for the party line. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave that. You said it for me. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to drop that just like this. All right? Sorry. It's okay. Sometimes I say it, sometimes I don't. I'm trying to move on. All right? So these are the narratives that were written and published about his struggle for the rights of the colored people, city um, railway cars. Um, and then. A, the address, they put that in the book. You can actually buy, you can actually buy um, copies of this. Named the Philadelphia Board 
of trade by the executive committee. That was very, I mean, for a black man to be on the executive board of trade in Philadelphia was a very significant thing. And because of that, the old thing, well, oh, you think you're better than us now, came about. Like, no, he didn't think he's better. He was trying to do right from the people in the, in the community, but, but because he became wealthy or significantly better off than some other people, he got chastised for it. There's a book that just came out here a year or two ago, and the author um, does a good job on telling the history, but part of his point is that, you know, I think his, his opinion is that William still became this elitist, thought he was an elitist. And I argue that point. William still came from Shimon. You cannot be, you can't, I don't care how much money you get in life. You come from being dirt poor like he was, and all the efforts that he tried to do for blacks in the city of Philadelphia, there's no way in the world he became an elitist. His book was, it was an exhibit at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1870s. Exposition in 1876, which is like the World Fair. It's a big deal. He served on the board of Orphan, Orphan Asylum for Children of Negro Soldiers and Sailors. He assisted the appointments of the Philadelphia first black police officer. He was a very successful coal and wood stove merchant. And there's so much stuff to talk about William. It could be a whole talk on William Still. I, I thought this was an interesting, I, I pulled this out started showing us about a year or two ago. We refer to Mr. William Still. He was one of, the, one of the prime movers amongst the colored people of this city to secure for themselves proper means of social, intellectual advancement. And on many occasions, he has shown a most proper spirit of liberty. In his business transaction, he has won a deservingly high reputation for integrity and promptness. That was listed in the... In the uh, North American United States Gazette. He was well, very well revered. Now, I already told you about Peter Still a little bit. Now, Peter Still was left in slavery. He was immediately sold to Kentucky. He ended up in Alabama. He served 40 years of slavery. Peter was able to buy his freedom in 1850 for $500 from two freemen from two brothers who were, they were called the Freeman Brothers. They were two Jewish merchants who owned them for a very short time. In 1850, the Freeman Brothers released Peter in Ohio. Um, there, there he traveled to Philadelphia where he met his brother William Still. Now, I'm just, I'm trying to not go too much into this, but I, I always bring, I need to understand this. I bring this out because it's important to me. I think it's important to everybody here. You know, the way, they, the, way they, they, the way history kind of makes slaves out, they, 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 they couldn't look at people. You shuffled around, yes sir, no man, but, and all that kind of stuff. You were dumb, not smart. You know, you didn't have education, you weren't smart. Peter didn't know, Peter didn't know how to read and write, but you know what he did? He had intuitive. He ended up in Alabama working. He got to an age where he really couldn't, wasn't a good field hand anymore. So then he got farmed out to, he would go work for your house or go work at your house or go work for your business. And he started learning different trades. He learned how to become a tailor. He learned how to fix shoes, right? So he started taking the, these clothes that the whites was giving him in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. He would fix them up, take them back to the plantation. Then slave, his friends would give him produce. He'd take the produce back in town. He would sell the produce. He was allowed to do this and save his own money on the weekends, right? So he's doing all this. He's working in your office, working in your office, and he's listening to the conversations. And he comes across these two, these two Jewish merchants, and he realizes that these two men weren't really thrilled about slavery. They did it because they needed some help, but they really, it wasn't something they were really thrilled about. And so he finally came to them one time, one day, and said, look, if you buy my freedom, if you buy me and allow me to pay you back, will you agree to that? And they were like, sure. And he was worried that they weren't going to hold up to the, to the agreement. But the night they brought him, he walks into their office with $300 and puts it on the table and says, here's $300 down on a 500 you just paid for me. That takes intelligence. 
That takes faith in God, but that takes to me intelligence. Because you had to be listening to what people were talking about. Enough to realize these two, these two men weren't really thrilled about slavery. And because Alabama's laws, they couldn't free them in Alabama, because Alabama, you couldn't free any of your slaves. Yes, all that. And he became so well known in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, when they purchased them, the, the, the locals there were like, Peter, what in the world? What is your problem? Do you, you don't want to work for those Jewish merchants. What's wrong with you? They're horrible people. We'll buy you back. Like, really? And so much so that when he became free, he travels into Philadelphia. He goes, someone says, you need to go to the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Office because he's looking for his mother and father. He goes into the office. He meets William Still. And he says, my mother's name was Sidney and my father's name was Levin. Williams listens is going, wait a minute, this is this is too close. This is a this is a story that my mother and my mother has been ups, been missing her two children all these years. It took him three days to convince Peter that they were brothers. He had to take him to his sister's house, Katara, who lived in and Mahala, who lived in Philadelphia, in order for them to reunite. But because of that, once it became his freedom. His eyes turned to his family that was left in Alabama. He had a wife and two children. He travels back to he travels back to Alabama, pretends that he's still a slave, and when he comes back, because again he was in muscle, he was in this town so frequently that no one really paid any attention that he was back. They just figured, oh well, you know, they let you come back down for a couple days. <laughs> you know, you sure you want to work for them? They're horrible people. So he gives his wife a piece of gingham, which is part of a, a fabric. And he, well, she gives him a piece of her dress, which is gingham. He takes that piece and he says, when you get this back, you'll know that the person who gives it to you is, is free, is, is here to help you. <coughs> now, yeah. So he comes back. William and his gentleman, Semp Conklin, he was kind of like an Irish, he was an Irishman, but he was like an adventurer. Like he just took on different things to do. They organized this escape plan to free Peter's family. And it failed. Conklin actually got down, got down to Peter's family, took them away. They got caught. And the family was sent back down, down to slavery to Alabama. And Conklin was handcuffed, tied, beat up hit in the head and thrown into the river and drowned. So then there's these letters all between the slave owner that owned Peter's family and William Still. And the slave owner said to, to William, to Peter, I'm gonna, you need $5,000 to get your family back. I don't know about you, but even today, if you told me to come up with $5,000 a day, I'd be like, okay, what bank am I getting the money from? You know? But what he did, he went talking through the, through the North and talked about how bad slavery was. He was introduced to Harry Beecher Stowe. I've had people tell me that Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin is, was loosely based on a little bit of Peter Stowe's life. I had somebody who was trying to research that, trying to figure that out. Um, but he met William Lloyd Garrison, all these people. And all these places he went, he gave talks. He raised the money that way. So he ended up um, freeing his family in 1855. Um, he ended up settling in Burlington, New Jersey, uh, on Jacobstown, I think it's Jacob, Jackson, Jackson, Jackson Road. He had a successful farm. He grew produce and delivered it to the market in Burlington City. Yeah, city. That's kind of the, the, oh, right, in the right in the middle of town. Yeah, and so it's so, and that's what that that headstone. That's his headstone. That's out in Bron That's in the middle of that cemetery in the middle of Burnley City. And it, and I got to go out there because his wife is across the way from him, but it's felt his headstone is down. Oh, 
<clears throat> now, everybody's got their favorite uncle. And kind of Dr. Still was mine. Um, he only received three months of formal education. He practiced, his practice was herbal medicine. He distilled his own medicine, medicine extracted from roots and herbs. And um, just a really phenomenal person when you start reading. If you read his autobiography, um, you'll see that the thoughts that he had about medicine, about curing people, and his approach to people. Um, this is actually a tenement house. It was a tavern that he was told that he, wasn't, he was not going to be able to buy it. The gentleman owned it said, nigger Jim, you will never own this. And Dr. Still went, the day that it went up for sale, Dr. Still went around there and put a bid on it and went on home after the afternoon, comes back, and the guy who won the, actually won the bid couldn't come up with a full mortgage. So when Dr. Still comes back around, Dr. Still, you, you won. So they turned it into a um, hospital and tavern. He's buried in Coleman Town Cemetery out there by Jacob Chapel. Cole. Coleman Town. Yeah, Coleman Town out of, if you take um, uh, Morristown, Mount Holly, Morristown Mount Laurel Road out to Elbow Lane, hang a left, oh. and there's a church right there, Jacob's Chapel, back behind Jacob's Chapel, AME. Jacob, Jacob's Chapel, AME Church. He was known, if, <laughs> I'm doing my research, I, I ran across this. If you know what Bright's disease, uh, this is scrofoli and congestive fever, or you might be a genealogist. <laughs> I ran across this a few times, like, okay, I'm, maybe I'm getting better at what I'm doing. So, um, scrofoli was like a, like a um, tuberculosis on the skin, and it was very prevalent in children at that time. But he used stuff like Queen Anne's lace, sassafras, skunk cabbage root, Virginia snake root plant, and tea berry. A lot of, and, and some of his, re some of his uh, recipes for things are in his book. Not a lot, but there are a few. This is an artist's rendition of his home. His office is still standing. His home fell down in 1932. He studied books on anatomy, physiology, botany, and the preparation of medicines. He developed a treatment for that cure skin cancer. He treated all races of people. And by the age of 70, he was the third largest landowner in Medford, New Jersey, and actually Burlington County, not just Medford, but Burlington County. He owned about $50,000 for the property wow. when he passed on in 1882. He had the latest technology. He didn't have to go outside for water. They ran, they had cisterns, water tanks on the front porch and in the back in his kitchen. They ran water that came off the roof into there. He also had pipes that ran from the cistern into his office down in the basement where he talks about where he distilled his medicines. So he didn't have to go outside to use the bathroom. He didn't have to go outside to get water either. Which was, at that time, in 18, he built the, he, he finished his, his home in 1869. He built the office in 1855. And then he finished his home in 1869. He had it built. He, he had it built, right? Um, stories like in his autobiography, it talks about he goes on vacation, goes to Long Branch in New Jersey, and he comes back after four days and comes back and the street is lined up with people waiting. And he helped not only blacks, but whites, every, all races of all people. Um, a lot of times, if you were already seeing somebody as a physician, he was under their treatment, he would say, until you, when you get finished with their treatment, you get finished with them not treating you or healing you, come see me. And a lot of times, they'd come see him. There are people, there are names of places in Medford area that are named after people that he helped cure. If it wasn't for him curing, they wouldn't have the name of the places because they wouldn't have lived. And that's how we got Medford the, the, uh, the inside in, in, the, in the township of Medford um, by Cranberry Hall in the center of town, they renamed the park after Dr. Still. And this is, this was his, where his home is at. This is present day. All right, he owned all this, all, and this in this area, this red. 
all this back in here. Different time. What street is that? that Church uh, Road. Church Road and 541 in Medford. This is, this is Medford Mahali Road. Okay. And this is Church. So if you, so if you travel along Church Road, and this is, if you go down here, this, down here is Lenape High School. Here is Route 70 down this way. But Lenape High, High School is down here. And this is, the, this is 541, which takes you back to Lumberton and on into Mahali. Okay. Yeah. So... So, yes, in a sense, yes. What, what has happened in 2006, because the office is still standing, um, the, let me go back. In 1932, when the house collapsed, his daughter was living in his house, was living in the house. When she died, um, she owed a mortgage on the house, and the house, his property was lost. The, the particular, where his home, where his aunt Bob, and they purchased not only his office, the grounds, but they also, they also um, brought the farmhouse that's next to it. And then, which goes all the way back to here. So that was 18 acres. And when I came along, I needed a parking lot. So thank you all for your tax dollars. <laughs> we got a parking lot out of the deal, right? Because we needed parking because we couldn't have events and have people park on the road here because Bernie County wouldn't allow us to park on the road, which makes sense. These people don't slow down here. So... The old farmhouse that we were in for a number of years, uh, they find deemed that it wasn't up the building code because we were running 300, 400 kids through it upstairs. and It was, it was all, and yeah. not to look bad at state. State was doing, but because of my, my, the nonprofit that, that I run now. So with that, in 2019, 2000, yeah, 20, COVID hit, right? We just moved in to the new visiting center here. So now we have this area here, all this area here. We have 22 acres that I manage as a volunteer with a few other family members and a whole host of. What building did, would you be working out of? We work out of this. It used to be an ice cream shop, ice cream parlor. That is our new visitor center. This is 541. This is called, the road is actually, it's, the address is 210 Medford Mahali Road. And we are open on the first and third Sundays of every month from 12 to 4. And the Boy Scouts, God bless them, have created a whole nature trail through here. Actually, I'm so, you know what? I'm even, I'm, I'm, miss, I'm messing up. This is the old farmhouse. This is the bunny farmhouse. So they, they brought this here to here, here, all back through here so to none here. none of it's going to be developed? Nope. Yeah. None of it. And it's the only historic site owned by the state of New Jersey to recognize African-American history. What was grown on that? One? It was a, it was, he was a farm. It was a farm. It, yeah, and like here, this is an old picture because right now you have a bunch of um, invasive trees like gum, uh, gum trees that have all sprouted up. But we have created, the boy, along with the Boy Scouts, we have created a, a nature trail through here. We have a, a butterfly reflection garden. Um, we're trying to do a community garden back in here. Um, the trails go through the woods. They actually connect to here and on through the woods and up in there. It's a really, it's a really beautiful site. Um, the grounds are open, 365. Um, and it's just a, it's, if you get an opportunity to go out there, it's a, it's a lovely, it's just nice. It really is. I can't even express to you. Carol was out there on, on Saturday. So the intersection here on the left is through there. There's a Wawa right here. There's a Wawa. There's an auto. There's a Eagle Auto Body right here. Yeah. There's a Wawa. There's a Wawa right there. There you go. Right. Thank you for coming. Leonard P High School. Yes, Johnson's farm. Yes. yes. You got it. You're there. So in 1870, he documented the first still family reunion in his book. He brought his um, seven or eight brothers and sisters that were still alive. My, my second grandfather was alive. Um, William was alive. 
uh, Mary was alive, and I think, um, oh, I can't remember everybody's name. Oh, Charles Wesley was still alive. And they had the first, so he documented the first family reunion in his book. He took a very naturalistic approach to curing ailments. He had this bulldog salve that he actually, he actually commissioned people to sell at pharmacies for him. I found a flyer from some pharmacy in Monmouth that sold his bulldog staff. But what I found was really interesting in his book is what his advice to young people, and um, it's very applicable today. He tell, tells young people back then, stay out of drinking houses, save your money, be respectful to each other, and buy property if you want to be prosperous in life. <laughs> Same stuff we probably all tell our kids every day, right? You know, Some listen, some don't. By the time he was 50, he paid off all his debt. He had a son, uh, Dr. James Still Jr., who became the third African-American male to graduate in 1871 from Harvard Medical School. Wow. Now, go ahead. Go ahead, Karen. William still had a daughter named Caroline Still, who was impressed about her cousin and her uncle, that she became a medical, she became the first female, black female physician in the city of Philadelphia. And because of this man's influence. Dr. Still, there's no documents saying that Dr. Still worked on the Underground Railroad. But it's inferred that because of his relationship with his brother, William, because we know in 1855, William and Dr. Still went to St. Catharines in Canada to visit a settlement that William Still was sending people to. Dr. Still, they didn't take days off back then. So he took three weeks off to go with his brother to go to Canada. I just think that he was going to help to see the people that he, was help that he helped. And he had enough money to at least give some assistance. But they were so secretive about what they did, their books that they wrote about themselves didn't talk about that stuff. When you read William Still's book, The Underground Railroad, William doesn't really talk about himself. There's no biography about himself. He briefly talks about his family. There's a chapter or two in there about how it's Seth Conklin and Peter Still and his mother. But there's no talk about all William Still's accomplishments. Williamson was so adamant about trying to help the community, the black community, was that, you know, he, if you wasn't about trying to help somebody, he didn't want to talk to you. He, there was, there were baseball clubs back then. There were civic or, organizations, you know, but they played baseball. He wrote a letter to the black baseball club and said, look, I'm not supporting y'all no more because y'all playing around too much. We got people out here that need to be fed, they need, we need to get a point, we need to get more jobs. We don't have time to fool around. So he cut people off. And that's where he got this, this thing about being elitist. Frederick Douglass, now we all, there's books and books about Frederick Douglass, right? You would think in his Underground Railroad about the abolitionists that he wrote about the Underground Railroad, you would think there would at least be a paragraph or two or a page. Frederick Douglass criticized William Still for writing the Underground Railroad in 1872. He told William that it should be the, the, the newly freed blacks that went through the Underground Railroad should write their own story. And William was like, they can't read and write, Frederick, Freddie. <laughs> Freddie, they can't read and write. So we need to put the story in, in you know, we need to memorialize this story. So he didn't put, there's, a, there's probably a sentence or two about Frederick Douglass in a whole 800-page book about the Underground Railroad of Frederick Douglass, old Freddie. <laughs> so, but there was, this, uh, there, was, there was this, a lot of, they were close as brothers, as a family they were close. Just some quick quotes. The laws of nature are justly executed. The rich, the poor, the learned, the unlearned, the king who rules a nation, where the beggar upon the wayside all meet on a common level of humanity at the grave. So it doesn't matter how much money you got in the world or how famous you become or how poor you are. At the end of the day, we're all in the dirt. All right? Riches are gained more by save, saving than by earning. It's no matter how much one earns, 
he can spend it all in less time than it took to earn it and still be poor. A man who is saving is often called mean and stingy. No doubt some are so, but I've often thought if it were not for some savings, there would be none to help another. And this is directly out of his book, Dr. James Stowe's book. A great mind is planted within us in the, in the beginning of our lives, and like other plants, it needs cultivation from the water and from the best fountain. So you don't think I pulled all this stuff out my rear end. I actually did some reading. What really has helped keep the family history together was William Stills' book, The Underground Railroad, 1872, Dr. James Stills' book, Early Recollections of Life with Dr. James Still, a book written by uh, Kate Picard, The Kidnapped and the Ransom, The Narrative of Peter and Vena Still, Are 40 Years of a Slave, Slavery. And that should be 1855, not 1865. I need to change that. Um, this right here is the movie. Th this, his story makes 12 years... Not to say anything bad about the Northland family, the 12 years of a slave, but his story makes that, that story like the, almost a cakewalk. You know? um, Lori Kahn was a great, great, was a granddaughter of Dr. Still. She wrote a book called William, William Still and Ingram Railroad, Fugitive Ties and Family Ties, 2010. Um, there's, some there's some corrections that need to be made, but it's a very good job. Um, here's the Peter Still papers. Uh, this parallel communities, you want to read a good book about um, these black communities in, in South Jersey. Uh, Rizzo's book's a good book for that. Uh, this up here is actually, this is William Still's American Collection, uh, Temple University Online Digital Collections. Um, and just some, more other, just some more other areas, other books that I've read and researched. This is a real good book for South Jersey. Could you go back one real quick? Mm-hmm. Yes, I have it for sale here too. Okay. Um, it's a very good book. I mean, out of all those, that, that would be your one. That I, um, I love all three of them. Right. But <laughs> if if you want to read a fascinating story, that's the story. And then to read Dr. James Still's book, because you get an understanding of of life how it was being black in, in that era, but his thoughts about medicine and how we treated people. It should be a book that doctors should read because it was the, it's his, his approach to things, you know? And William Still's book, Down on the Railroad, now there's different books that are written. They tick, they tick piece and pieces out of it. And I tell my family all the time, if you're going to read something about your family, go to the source. Because in the Underground Railroad, it's all these stories about how people became free. You just don't read it from cover to cover. You, you, like you, you'll, you want to read something for about 20 minutes, you open a book up, and you, and you get stuck on a story about how you know, four or five slaves got together and they ran away. You know? And then you go on to the next chapter, and it's about another seven or eight. You know? And, and, and what, makes, what makes this book so current today is that there are still people who use that book to find their family members. Because when he, when he realized that Peter still got connected with his family after 40 years of being a slave, he realized that that information would last for, for centuries, and it has. Dr. Charles Bloxon at Temple University has a whole building, and it's called the Dr. Charles Bloxon Underground Railroad Museum, or a library over in Temple University. And if it wasn't for the fact that his grandfather's name was in the Underground Railroad book, we wouldn't have that, we wouldn't have that library today. He started some 50 years ago on this quest to find his family history, and it turned into that. So it's still prevalent to this day, still rele relevant to today. You know, this whole thing with Henry Box Brown, this is history of Runnymede. Um, Giles Wright was the, was the uh, New Jersey African-American historian, wrote some really amazing information on South Jersey. A lot of history here in South Jersey. A lot of good history, and not just black history, but just good history. Stuff that some of these stories is amazing. I helped this gentleman here uh, with the historical content of his of his book, this children's book. And it is if you have grandkids that are young 
and you want to introduce them to the Underground Railroad, even if they're up in the fifth and sixth grade, it's still a good book to just give them a, 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 a way to look at it. Um, he did a phenomenal job. And when a man contacted me about two or three years ago, he told me, I'm trying to find some, I have some questions about your family history. I write these books on African American history. And I, as I'm talking to him, I'm Googling his name and ordering books from Amazon. Because I get people to contact me. Oh, I want to, I'm writing a book on, on I want to use Dr. Still. Or I want to do this. And it's like, you, know, you look at them and you listen to what they're saying and you find out what the story is. And it's like, like one guy was writing a story, a, myst a, 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 a mythical story, and he had doctors still giving birth to the, to, to the Jersey Devil. And I was like, dude, I can't. <laughs> he wasn't a witch doctor, you know? And the time periods aren't even correct. I'm not doing it. I'm not watering down my family history the best if I, if I can help it. But this book, he definitely hit the mark. Really, really, really nice guy. Um, somebody came, this is me standing in Dr. Still's office looking in. And uh, I thought about this one day, and I was dealing with some issues. <laughs> and I came up with this quote. That, as, a history, as a history enthusiast, I am not interested in regurgitating the same old stories in order to satisfy the egos of a few historians. I'm interested in debunking the fake lore and encouraging people to find their truth about our ancestors. For far too long, our story has been told by others. It is long overdue for us to do our own research and tell our own story. Because far too long, there's been somebody that's taken Dr. Still's story, taken the Still family story, pushed, mashed it all together, and has messed up the story and got people so confused about the guinea prince and this and that, that the Still family's all together. I got people in, in, in Mississippi swerving down at their uncle named Isaac is Isaac on my family tree line. It's like, come on. Start doing, and, and you, show them that, you show them the documents and, and the days people were born, and they still don't want to believe it. I know I'm your cousin. Like, no, you're not. Like, William Grant still, there's no connection of William Grant still to the still family in New Jersey. There's none. But you read Wikipedia, and every still that's in the world is part of the still family. And we all come from Lawnside, which is not true. <laughs> So when the next still comes up to you and goes, oh, I'm a still. And you know, I'm from Longside. You just look at him and say, OK. <laughs> you know. Don't take the heat. I'll take, send them to me. I'll take it. <laughs> this is what his office looked like a few years ago. And now they restored it. They took the aluminum siding off. This piece was taken off. This front porch was taken off. And you see these right here, these cornices? That's 1855 work. Still there. Still intact. And the ones that ran down the side of the house, <laughs> when they built this addition, they didn't take it off. So when they took the addition off, these cornices are still sitting right there in perfect condition. Yes. See down the side? All these were in perfect condition. There was. They got to rebuild it. They got to rebuild it. I don't know if I. What happened here? Look at this. I'm on, maybe maybe this thing is not hitting. Yeah. See if I can get this going. I'm almost done. So we bring kids out. Oh. Yeah. Something's going on. It's searching for that connection. It's searching. There you go. So we bring kids out, teach them about Dr. Still. We had an archaeological dig. We found artifacts, um, some pretty cool stuff. We found a piece of his wood stove that was dated 1869, the year that he finished the house. So he wasn't buying cheap. He wasn't buying late stuff. He was buying brand new stuff to put in his house. It's part of my team there. We. Last year, because of COVID, <laughs> we did the we had the, we had the William Still book, and we couldn't. Um, I was afraid to ask them, but we wanted to, we wanted to, we wanted to tell we wanted to read the story to kids, and I was like, well, we can't we can't anybody we can't ask anybody to bring their kids here because it's COVID, right? So we all dressed up like kids. This was a, <laughs> this, this was a school teacher. Yeah, we dressed up like kids and, and read 
did it ourselves. It was pretty funny. We actually did it on YouTube. Um, I was a militant at an Afro. <laughs> so here's my sales, my sales kick. Our website, drjamesstillcenter.org. This is our email, my email. Our nature trails are open year-round. Um, we've now moved to 210 Medford Mahali Road. Please come out and visit us, first and third. Um, I have the Dr. James Still autobiography book. I have the Peter Still Kidnapped and a Ransom. I have another book that Stockton University, we partnered with Stockton. And in uh, the 1886 edition of Underground, the Underground Railroad book, there was an interview uh, that a person did with William Still. We took that out of the Underground Railroad book and put it in a separate book. And we have that for sale because it was pretty large. And then I have, the, I have two copies of the children's book. Um, we just, a couple, about a year ago, my cousin Ollie, his, his daughter, who's my co-chair, went to stand up one day and she was complaining about her knee aching. And our herbalist that we have on the team said to her very nonchalantly, you know there's an herb for that. <laughs> I started thinking we need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> so now we have a few, I have a few t-shirts for sale that and I, didn't get, I didn't get the whole selection because I didn't know how large the crowd was going to be. But we have this t-shirt now that says there's an herb for that. <laughs> so um, there's a display on, over there about the coffee and cakes and all that stuff. Um, and I've got books there for sale. There's some postcards. Um, and if you get an opportunity, really just come out and just walk the grounds, you know, and, and the, it's a beautiful nature walk. You'll probably run into the deer, sometimes the turkeys. Um, it's harmless. No, I, I, there, there are some stuff in this book, but it's not. Understand also, herbalist, being an herbal medicine, the herbalist back then, was, was typical was a very typical thing. It was because you didn't have medicine that wasn't synthesized. Yeah. So he learned a lot from reading other books and just kind of doing you know, the natural way of watching people. But yeah, unfortunately, and I, and I would love to take some time to learn to become more about herbalism, but I, with all I got going on, there's no, I don't have enough time. That's why I got herbalists on my team that, that, that do that for us. And, she's, and Fran is great. Um, she, we, they, we sometimes affectionately call her Dr. Fran because she, she, she's always making turmeric shots for us or uh, making ginger teas and all different stuff. So, um, yeah. But that's, you got any questions for me? Um, thank you for your time. I hope I entertained you enough, didn't bore you. I didn't see anybody sleeping, so that's a good thing. Um, but, And whatever I don't have for sale today, if I run out or I have, um, I have probably enough books for everybody here. Um, the books are $15. The, the Stockton books are, the Underground Railroad book is $50. Um, and we're working on reprinting that for next year. Um, we got a, good, a lot of good things going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.